For those of you who don't know me, I've been practicing typography for what could be argued my entire life, what I often refer to as my misspent youth. My father is a retired printer, and some nights after work and some weekends, he ran a small press out of our basement, where my brothers and sisters and I were often drafted into service. My mother, a calligrapher and letterer, has always had informed opinions about both formal writing and typography. But enough bragging about my childhood. For the 20 or so years spanning the turn of the century, in addition to designing type and teaching design, I designed books, hundreds of books. And in the second decade of my book design career, I concentrated on large, information-rich books on science and nature. In designing those books, Wallbaum was always in the back of my mind for running text, and not just any cut of Wallbaum, but monotype Wallbaum. It came closest to striking that appropriate tone for books on science and nature. Wallbaum is a modern, one of a handful of late 18th and early 19th century designs that championed idealized forms over handwriting as a typographic model. Bedoni and Dido are, of course, the poster children for the modern style, and Wallbaum is the lesser known cousin. Wallbaum is the least dogmatic of the group. While moderns by definition have large excites, high contrast between thick and thin, and hairline serifs, Wallbaum tempers those tendencies. It has warmth and humanity. And in that combination of idealized form, abstraction of traditional type models, and warmth, it captured some essence of the excitement and experimentation of early scientific discovery. It's bright and clear and ahead of its time. Wallbaum isn't as stiff or sparkly as Bedoni or Dido. It's a modern and yet not a modern. It has a modern formality and snap, but it's comfortable to read and inviting. But as much as I liked monotype Wallbaum, especially in metal, I couldn't use it often. The digital version had some problems. The conversion from metal to film and from film to digital hadn't been kind to the face. That's true of many classic fonts, and like many digital fonts copied from a single size of metal type, monotype Wallbaum worked well at only one size. In the case of Wallbaum, that was 11 and a half point. In addition to lacking optical sizing, the overall family, beyond the italic, was limited and inconsistent, and the quality of the outlines meant that using it for display was perilous. But when it worked, in that little limited window. It was beautiful. In 2014, I designed my penultimate book, The Flora Illustrata, which was a history of horticulture as told through the holdings of the Meritz Library at the New York Botanical Garden. I wanted to use Wallbaum for the text, but size constraints and the format of the book made it untenable. I did use monotype Wallbaum for the part titles, the chapter titles, and some of the heads, but even there, I ended up hand-lettering the largest type. For the text, I opted for James Montalbano's excellent Kinney type, which proved more economical space-wise, and most importantly, very sturdy at smaller sizes. I love James's work, but I was still a little typographically depressed that I couldn't make Wallbaum work in this instance. All of that was in the back of my head when I met Carl Crossgrove shortly after joining Monotype in 2015. Carl is a true typographic talent with a host of well-known typefaces to his name, including Mundo Sands, Biome, Burlingame, Origami, and Relic. While I had been moaning internally about inside of my head about the Wallbaum palette, he had been working on his own beautiful Wallbaum-inspired modern. It was a meeting of the Wallbaum typographic minds, and though it took another year or so to get the project underway, the seed was planted. Between then and now, it took a lot of research and experimentation, and thousands of hours of font making, and a huge cast of characters, to make the revitalized Wallbaum a reality. Throughout it all, as we navigated the wide territory of a type revival, we kept one question at the front of our minds. What would Eustace do? Now, this may sound pithy or even like dad humor, but the essence is heartfelt. 
what would he have made of his own type, given our tools and our uses? It's an impossible question to answer, but one that drove us to learn as much as we could about the essence of Walbaum. Research helps answer part of it. What did Eustace do? And it starts to answer other important questions, questions important to type designers and students of type. Who was Eustace? Where did he live and work? What was his life like? How did he and his work change over the course of his career? It's those questions that I'll answer in part tonight. Research, of course, involves libraries, our great friends, and my happiest of indoor happy places. My first stop was at the New York Public Library to fill in some broad biographical and background details, and to see some early 19th century printing journals and specimens. It was at the New York Public Library that I first encountered Gustav Bahati's excellent biography of Walbaum. It's been parked on my bedside for months, both challenging my comprehension of German and my ability to stay awake. It's beautiful and informative, obviously a labor of love. My deepest thanks to, <clears throat> to the memory of Gustav Bohati. From there, I went up to the rare book and manuscript library at Columbia University to see an early Walbaum specimen. Toshi Amagari sent some helpful material from our archives in Salfords, England the Walbaum issue of the Monotype Recorder. The issue, as it states clearly on the cover, has a wealth of information on Walbaum's early years as a type founder. And then Carl reached out to Amelia Huggle Fontenelle, who sent some tantalizing images of later printings of Walbaum from the Cary Graphic Arts Collection at RIT. And then Ralph Hermann, the typographic guru in Weimar, Germany, guided me to the German National Library in Leipzig, where, through librarian René Rolla, I was able to see the last known specimen printed by Eustace, as well as several specimens of his son's work. From Leipzig, it was a short trip to Berlin to see some excellent printings of Walbaum's type produced after the Walbaum's punches and sorts were sold to the publisher F.A. Brockhaus. There were many, many others who helped in the research and the idea of an incomplete roll call mortifies me. Suffice it to say, I love libraries, librarians, and librarianship with the same devotion and respect I feel for conservators, historians, and all stripes of scientists. And I'm deeply grateful to everyone that helped put me face to face with Walbaum. Carl and I were talking about Walbaum back in 2015 because monotype type director Steve Madison had asked all of us to consider a full-throated modern to add to the monotype library. As the project got into full swing, Carl and I were aided and abetted by Juan Villanova, who made the engraved and decorated caps and, the digitized, uh, and then digitized the copious Walbaum ornaments. Toward the end of the project, Lin Yun expertly edited and kerned the display italics. And there were literally dozens of other instrumental partners and champions, both inside and outside of Monotype, to whom the family owes a huge debt. But you're here tonight to hear about the original, the one, the only Eustace Eric Walbaum, and you will in very great detail. This is just an aside to explain how our Walbaum ended up in the world and how I ended up in front of you tonight. By the end of this talk, you will know more about Walbaum than all of your friends, and all of your friends' friends combined. And you'll see at least some of what makes his work so beguiling and useful 200 years after it was originally designed. With that preamble, let's go. Little baby Eustace was born on the 25th of January, 1768, which makes him an Aquarius, like me, and Paul Carlos, and John Baskerville, and Jan van Krimpen, and Gian Battista Bedoni. But unlike all of us, Little baby Eustace was born in Steinlau, Prussia, about 160 miles west of Berlin. He was the youngest child in a family of seven children. His father, Johannes Gebhard Eustace Eric Walbaum, was already 44 years old when Eustace was born. He was a Lutheran clergyman who, early in his life, had been a private tutor. Johannes was the pastor at the tiny church of St. Catherine, and it was at this small church that Eustace Walbaum was baptized 
three days after his birth in 1768. The church is small, and the village of Steinla is small, and it remains so to this day. His mother, Eleonora Caterina Sophia Robert, was 32 when Eustace was born, and died just three years later. So little Eustace was raised by his father and his six older siblings. In Prussia in the 18th century, a high value was placed on education. It was one of the first countries in the world to introduce free public education. Martin Luther had preached the necessity of an individual's interpretation of the Bible, and so being able to read was a religious imperative. In addition to reading, writing and math were considered essential skills for every religious and industrious citizen. Eight years of public education was the basic requirement. Prussian children of affluent parents would have had an additional four years of education, generally in preparation for university study. But Johann Waldbaum, a clergyman in a small town, was not affluent. But he obsessed over the academic success of his children. Eustace, whether he realized it or not, was lucky. Lucky to be born into a country that placed such a high value on education in the 18th century, and lucky also to be born the youngest in a large family, with a tutor as a father. He attended public school and received additional lessons from his father and his brothers and sisters. By all accounts, he was a talented student, gifted and intelligent, but he wasn't particularly engaged by schoolwork. That is to say, he was a child. And as a child, he wasn't terribly concerned or aware of the privilege of a Prussian public education. Like me and possibly you as a child, he saw school as a duty and a chore. He was, to his father's chagrin, a free spirit, who enjoyed being outdoors in nature. Steinla was surrounded by tree-covered hills, and there was a large lake nearby. Walbaum decided he wanted to be a horticulturalist, to be outside and to work with plants. In addition to the Steinla countryside, there were also grand gardens in nearby Kassel and Braunschweig. The region of Prussia to the north, south, and east of Steinla was rife with culture and economic activity. Whatever the inspiration, Little Walbaum developed an early and abiding love of horticulture and gardening. But his father, for reasons most parents will understand, had other plans for him. Eustace would become a merchant, a solid, practical, industrious merchant. In an arrangement made by his father, young Eustace was sent north to Braunschweig to board with his father's friend and church associate, the Reverend August Anton Eobald Allers. Pastor Allers had known Eustace since he was a little baby and agreed to look after the boy for a year or possibly two to further his education and perhaps to find him an apprenticeship. Apprenticeships were, after all, an obvious route for someone of Walbaum's background the son of a clergyman from a small town, without enough money to consider additional schooling and a university degree. An apprenticeship meant a prolonged servitude, but it offered the opportunity to improve one's station in life by learning a trade. Soon after young Eustace arrived in Braunschweig, Pastor Aller arranged an apprenticeship for him at Grabenhorst's, a reputable confectioner and grocer. The Graben Horse apprenticeship occupied the bulk of young Walbaum's teenage years. It's likely that teen Eustace was indentured at Grabenhorst for four to five years. He learned a good deal about the business of the grocery in that time, but he also found something that interested him much, much more. A peculiar aspect of bakery production, the carving of pastry molds. The molds in question were, and are, used to make posen, or Springerla, as they're called in southern Germany. The molds themselves are carved in relief on a block of wood, either as individual pieces or with multiple designs on a single block. The moist dough is then pressed into the mold, released, and baked. The carving of these molds so intrigued young Eustace that when his long apprenticeship finally finished, and he was given his journeyman certificate by Grabenhorst, he set out not to become a merchant, but to carve his own posen molds. But having just completed a long indenture, he didn't have the money to purchase his tools, 
So he did what you or I would do, and by that I mean what you or I would do in the 18th century. He made his own tools. And not just a nice workbench. According to Pastor Allers, he broke up old sword blades, converted them into chisels, procured suitable wood from home, and began to engrave. In what will become a recurring refrain in the life of Walbaum, he was good at it, and was successful, quite successful, and quickly segued from carving molds in wood to carving molds in steel. Here again, he did very well, making enough money that he abandoned being a merchant altogether and devoted himself to engraving. At the tender age of 22, he cut a medallion honoring Abbot Johann Friedrich Wilhelm Jerusalem, a prominent Lutheran theologian from Braunschweig who had died a year earlier in 1789. By Pastor Aller's account, and he would have known, Walbaum had achieved a speaking likeness of the abbot, despite next to no artistic training. The medal brought the young Eustace great acclaim and additional work in carving steel. The medal shown here sold at auction last year for around $380. The listing contained no mention that it had been cut by Germany's celebrated typographic son, Eustace Walbaum. But to us, especially to Karl Crossgrove and I, the medal shows the DNA of both Walbaum's modern style inclinations and his unique serif and letter shapes, especially in the capital R. His steel engraving skills attracted the attention of a Braunschweig music and art dealer. During his last years in Braunschweig, Walbaum began working with Johann Peter Speer. Herr Walbaum began cutting music plates for the sale at Speer's shop. As you've been warned to expect, he was very good at it, despite having no knowledge of music and no experience at engraving it. Good or not, the business of music printing proved less lucrative and successful than his previous engraving business, and though Speer continued in the music business, he did it without Walbaum. Around that same time, on the 25th of June, 1795, Herr Walbaum married Augusta Dorothea Magdalena Müller at the church of St. Ulrike Gemeinde, with his father and the bride's parents in attendance. In the church record, Walbaum lists his profession as engraver and medallion maker. It's during this pivotal juncture in the young man's life that Walbaum attaches himself to friend and patron Ernst Wilhelm Gottlieb Kircher, who gently or otherwise guided Eustace toward the art of carving punches and stamping matrices. The punches, after all, were carved from steel, something by now Walbaum was very adept at. Kircher was ten years older than Walbaum, and was described as one of the most industrious book printers of his time. In 1783, Kircher had married the heir and proprietress of the Dunkerschein printing house in Goslar, Germany. Dunkerschein was a large and old establishment that had fallen on hard times. Kircher promised his bride that he would revitalize her family business, and as part of that effort, he pursued multiple schemes establishing businesses in Einbeck to the south and Braunschweig to the north. In Goslar itself, he attempted to set up a playing card factory, a plan which ultimately was undone by the local burgemeisters. While in Braunschweig, he met Walbaum and set up yet another plan. In an angle to revitalize Dunkerschen, Kircher planned to establish a type foundry there. In addition, in, in a plan that resembles a shell game, Kircher petitioned the burgemeisters of Goslar in 1796 with the following opening salvo. Most and right honorable, most prudent, most worthy and respected sirs, Ernst Wilhelm Gottlieb Kircher, printer, humbly supplicates for an exclusive privilege to set up a type foundry. His petition continued by asking for a monopoly as long as he and his wife were alive. The supplication and perhaps he and his wife's political connections, worked. The petition was granted that same day. But just over a little, just over a month later, Kircher again wrote the city council to offer a deed of session, turning over his privilege to Eustace Eric Walbaum. And within a week of that, Eustace petitioned the city council, requesting citizenship and all its attendant privileges in the city of Goslar. 
With his petition, he presented a glowing letter of recommendation from his former benefactor, the Reverend Allers. We should all have an Allers to write our letters of recommendation. His praise of Eustace is extensive and convincing. And, in addition to singing his praises, he paved the way for some economic advantages for Eustace. He wrote, All he owns is the fruit of his hard toil, with no income, or practically none, accruing from his old father and his parents-in-law. Therefore, deal with the young man as gently as possible. The Burgermeisters took Aller's words to heart, and on Monday, the 18th of July, 1796, at the age of 28, Volbaum was granted citizenship, the privilege to set up a type foundry, and a tax-free period of two years. And with that, he began his career as a type founder in Goslar. It should be mentioned that Goslar was a medieval town that had known tremendous wealth leading up to the 18th century as a result of an extensive mining operation nearby. Founded in the year 979, it had been known as the Rome of the North for its cosmopolitan atmosphere, its advanced water and sewage system, thanks to the mining effort, and its preponderance of churches. But Falbaum arrived 200 years after the mining had established the wealth of Goslar. In the intervening time, Goslar had lost control of the mines and the wealth, but not the bureaucracy and sense of importance that came with it. Goethe described Goslar, sorry, Goethe described Goslar as suffering under the weight of its own privilege. The first years of his work as a punch cutter were difficult, owing to the obvious learning curve. I'm not sure, but I suspect that he received at least some helpful advice and direction from Kierker's contracts, contacts in the printing industry. I've come to expect that Walbaum was good at everything he did, but the idea of cutting and casting type without any training seems a bit far-fetched. Nonetheless, his progress was quick but measured. He cut and recut his earliest types with an eye towards improving the readability, color, and style of his printed text. He experimented relentlessly, costing himself time and money, but the results were excellent. His small handful of fonts sold very well, which was important since in 1798, the year that his tax-free status was to expire, Augusta and Eustace had their first child, a son they named Heinrich Theodore. Young Theodore would eventually become his father's helper, and when he turned 30, his father's successor in the type-founding business. And in the following year, their second child was born, Augusta Amalia Walbaum. In his first six years of punch cutting, Walbaum worked at an amazing pace, cutting 12 full fonts, five Romans, four italics, and three fractures, in sizes equivalent to today's 5 to 11 point. I'll break it down a little so you can be as amazed as I am. If Eustace starts from zero in 1796, and we grant him a year of setup and experimentation to the midpoint of 1797, and he works every day until October of 1802. That's 1,917 days. And if he keeps the Sabbath holy and avoids working on holidays, he's down to 1,631 days. And if his fonts are averaging 150 characters, upper and lower case, small caps, accented characters, punctuation, figures, and reference marks. Then, by the year 1802, he's cut in the neighborhood of 1,800 sorts. That puts him around the average for a very seasoned punch cutter, one punch a day. With a little time left over to cast type, print specimens, and carry on the business. And, of course, to be a young father and devoted husband. He also cut an impressive array of assor an assortment of figures, rules, borders, ornaments, math sorts, and other symbols. In 1803, he produced a specimen of his work in Goslar. And you're looking at a copy of that specimen that resides just up the road at the Rare Book and Manuscript Library at Columbia University. It's lovely and delicate. Its very existence is miraculous. But more amazing still is that within the same record at the library, exists a small smoke proof of a handful of sorts made by Walbaum. No bigger than a matchbook, it's the clearest glimpse we have, the closest we can get, 
to the hand of Eustace Valbaum at work. There's no fluctuation of the press, no casting irregularities, no squeeze of ink around the edges, barely an intermediary between the observer and Valbaum. From his mind, to his hand, to his gravers, to the steel of the punch, to the surface of a smooth sheet of paper. Just ghosts of the steel in a layer of soot. In it you see the letters and ornaments as Valbaum saw them for the first time. The 1803 Goslar specimen was a record of Eustace's accomplishments to that date. But it was also a Dear John letter to Goslar, because, unbeknownst to old Goslar, on the 5th of September, 1802, Valbaum had sent a petition to the Duke of Saxe-Weimar, requesting permission to set up a foundry there. His petition was granted a month later, and in early 1803, following the birth of his second daughter, Amelia Charlotta, Walbaum and his family moved to Weimar. The move to Weimar was not Walbaum's idea. It was instead made at the prompting of his newer and better friend and benefactor, Friedrich Johann Houston Bertruck. Bertruck was an intellectual, a writer, a publisher, a printer, and a businessman. At one point, his publishing works in Weimar employed nearly 500 people, around 10% of the Weimar population. One of Bertruck's greatest hits was the 12-volume picture, picture Book for Children, consisting of nearly 1,200 pages and published over a 40-year period from 1790 to 1830. Bertruck convinced Fallbaum that an exponentially larger market for his fonts existed in Weimar and nearby Leipzig. Fallbaum hesitated briefly, but quickly realized that it made sound economic sense prompted, perhaps, by the financial needs of his growing family. However, within months of arriving in Weimar, his youngest daughter, her mother's namesake, died at the age of three. One can't doubt that it was a crushing blow for the young parents. Vaubaum's work may have provided some relief or diversion, if not simply being a necessity. But it proved, as Bertruck had promised, with orders for Vaubaum's excellent types flowing in from Weimar, Jena, Leipzig, and abroad. Weimar, Jena, and Leipzig were hyper hyperactive hubs of literature, universities, publishing, and printing. The printing and publishing house of Bertruck in Weimar, the printers and publishers of Leipzig, the university at Jena, and the works of the legendary Goethe and Schiller were all part of a fabric that distinguished this region of Prussia at the turn of the 19th century. In 1804, as the business continued to grow, Frau Augusta gave birth to their second son, Karl Ricard, in October. And by 1805, Walbaum had to extend, expand the footprint of his foundry to cast enough type to satisfy the publishers. But in 1806, Prussia and the Weimar-Leipzig region suffered a huge blow with the invasion of Napoleon's forces. A decisive twin battle was fought in the nearby towns of Jena and Auerstedt, where the Prussian forces were decimated by Napoleon's faster troops. Between the French and the Prussians, 50,000 men were killed, wounded, or captured in the countryside. The French forces looted and ransacked the area. Walbaum's shop was stripped and wrecked, and in the aftermath, he thought seriously about abandoning the region and type founding, because, of course, it was not only a matter of rebuilding his shop, but waiting for the businesses that he served to return to normal. The period between 1806 and 1812 became known as the war years in Prussia. The occupation by the French drained money and resources from the region, slowed any rebuilding efforts, and depressed the economy. As time wore on, resentment of the French grew into hatred and a desire for revenge. By 1812, a coalition of nations began forming to push back against the French. Early on in the French occupation, in February of 1807, Volbaum's third daughter, Eleonora Wilhelmina Carolina, was born, which increased by 25% the imperative that he return his business to normal. But then, in March of 1810, Volbaum's wife, Augusta, died at the age of 36 perhaps a victim of the wartime diseases of typhus, 
dysentery, and cholera that swept through the region as the population moved from the countryside and concentrated in larger towns and cities for safety. Vaubaum buried himself in work, by all reports, laboring day and night, now assisted by his 12-year-old son, Theodore. Theodore was now roughly the age his father was when he was sent to Braunschweig, but rather than sending him away, Eustace apprenticed him at the foundry. He was learning the family business. In 1812, as Napoleon began his disastrous push into Russia, Walbaum, age 44, widowed and with four young children, published his last known and most complete specimen. It's a small, 54-page, self-covered booklet with a single thread binding. The pages are printed on one side in black ink only on handmade wove finish paper. Fraktur fonts, of which there are 17, are presented first, followed by 28 Roman and italic fonts. Adding 23 new fonts to those shown in the 1803 specimen. It's very probable that there were other specimens printed by Volbaum after this one, and many of these fonts appear in specimens printed more than a decade later by Theodore. But this is the last one that we can definitely point to as containing only Eustace's fonts. The largest type is the Kleinisabon, at around 76 points. All of the types larger than the Kleine Cicero were cut in Weimar. These smaller sizes are the same fonts printed in the 1802 specimen from Goslar. But the press work is better, and the small booklet format is twice as charming. The Roman and Italic fonts are followed by three new Greek fonts, a new and very legible script font, and a page of Rudolf Coe-like signs and symbols. There's a page of rules and brackets, and three pages of borders and ornaments, including 30 new styles. Various sizes and styles of figures are distributed throughout the booklet. The repeating ornaments are especially enchanting, and doubled, if not quadrupled, Vaughn Villanova's work in our Walbaum family. The whole production ends with a two-page price list. The prices for Fraktur fonts are roughly the same as Antiqua. However, the italics cost a bit more. And I especially like the very workmanlike and accommodating notes at the very end. All foreign letters and languages and all existing scripts can be cast when required. And also, please, if you order fonts, let us know whether or not word spaces, M squares, and other white spaces should be included. I like the sentiment. If you need it, I will provide. But I also like hearing Walbaum talk about day-to-day -day things across two centuries. In May of 1814, a 46-year-old Eustace Walbaum remarried. His new wife, Frederica Christiana Budius, age 41, helped raise and educate his four living children and remained Walbaum's companion for the rest of his life. Theodore continued to work with his father through the 18-teens and 1820s, his progress, as evidenced in his later specimens, was at least steady, if not extraordinary. His father must have been pleased and proud, both with the quality of Theodore's work and that he'd been, and that he'd been able to extend his legacy and ensure his son's prosperity. In 1828, when Eustace reached the age of 60, Theodore took over the foundry business. It may have been a relief not to have to go to work anymore, or he may have continued to pop in occasionally offering sage advice. However he dealt with retirement, the first year wasn't easy. That year his son-in-law died suddenly, followed quickly by the death of his favorite granddaughter, who had attached herself to Grandpa Eustace from the time she could first walk. Following those tragedies, and perhaps to help him escape to some degree, he returned to his childhood dream of becoming a gardener, spending days folding into years, tending plants, and enjoying the outdoors. Theodore's output was prodigious and varied. His types are far more refined than his father's, and cover a range of styles that speak both to his skill and the explosion of typographic form in the early decades of the 19th century. 
He produced a handful of these loose specimen sheets, which show a variety of very finely detailed text faces. But these were just the tip of the iceberg. In the mid-1830s, <clears throat> as he began publishing a complete showing of his types, and some of his fathers, in the less than succinctly named Journal für Buchdruckerkunst, Schriftgießerei und die Verwandten Faker, or the Journal for Book Printing Arts, Typefounding, and the Related Subjects. They're all very well printed, despite these images. The paper is bright and smooth, and the ink is coal black. There are literally dozens of large pages covered in different styles and sizes of types. The rules and ornaments alone span about 20 pages. Theodore had been a very busy man. The specimens appear over multiple volumes of the journal. Theodore was midway through publishing the complete specimen in July of 1836 when he took a summer holiday at the nearby resort of Bad Berka, just south of Weimar. While there, he was involved in a carriage accident and was killed instantly. The tragedy for Eustace could be nothing short of profound. His first son, heir to his legacy, and an extremely accomplished type designer in his own right, was gone at 36. 38 years old. The remaining pages of the specimen were printed in the journal as a tribute to Theodore and as a service to his grieving 68-year-old father. Eustace returned to the foundry briefly to organize the material for sale. In November 1836, less than six months after Theodore's death, Eustace sold the foundry materials to the printing arm of the Leipzig-based publisher F.A. Brockhaus to be folded into their large in-house foundry. In June of the following year, Volbaum contracted the flu and after a week of steady decline, died in his sleep on the 21st at the age of 69. His obituary, printed shortly after his death, paints a glowing portrait as obituaries are wont to do. But knowing typographers and type designers, as many of us do, there are at least a few lines here and there that ring true. It reads, In his business relationships and personal relationships, he was the personification of honesty and reliability. He combined great decisiveness and strength of character with the noblest of softness and tenderness. His mind was clear and bright, even when contemplating the most complicated things. His judgment was always as modest as correct. His heart was pure and open to all good and noble. His whole being was mild and without falsity. He spoke in highly agreeable terms, pleasant and instructive. He was full of serenity and jest, but always with a noble earnestness and decency. He was mild and beneficial to those less fortunate. His very being was a pleasure to every good person and the greatest blessing for his entire family. He shared his happiness uninterrupted with every member of his family. One was at ease around him and could not help but respect and admire this excellent man. He sought the same qualities of mind and heart in others and gathered but a small circle of friends whose conversation was so important to him that he didn't let a week pass by, especially later in his life, without enjoying their company. The obituary then ends with these two bits of information both puzzling and frank. These bits, I believe, 100%. They're just too specific and too strange to be generic obituary praise. He was nearly free of weakness and peculiarities, with one exception. He had an insurmountable fear of mad dogs, even in the seasons when he knew that they wouldn't be about. He knew, him, he knew it himself to be foolish, but he never strayed far from the house without a stick containing a small, hidden sword. He was a slight man, but not small in stature. His eyes were open, friendly, and clear. His forehead was smooth, his mouth fine, and his nose sharp-pointed, somewhat large, more straight than curved, and not off-putting. Yes. It ends with three phrases about the shape and lack of disdain for Walbaum's nose. Eustace Walbaum's typefaces drifted out of the public consciousness for nearly a century. 
The firm of F.A. Brockhaus included both the father and son's fonts in their specimen books, unattributed throughout the remainder of the 19th and the beginning of the early 20th centuries. The printing in the Brockhaus specimens is superb, and if you're acquainted with Fallbaum's fonts, they are, by far, the best place to see them in all their finery and, and detail. The common narrative about the disappearance of Walbaum's fonts is that, following the expulsion of the French and Napoleon's imprisonment on Elba, the taste for things in the French style waned considerably, and I'll admit that I've done my part to further that version of the story. Walbaum's fonts, to a typographer's eye, owe a huge debt to Fr Dito's French style. But that version of the story attributes a great deal of typographic sophistication to the Prussian publishers and readers. They hated type in the French style? If Volbaum had cut type in the Italian old style, or Caslon's old style, or Baskerville's transitional style, would that have been acceptable? Did Prussian readers really see all modern type as French? While I see 18th and 19th century Prussians as sophisticated and learning, learned citizens, quibbling over texts set in the French style seems a bit much. It seems more likely that it was not purely a rejection of the French style, but a championing of the fracture over Roman or Antiqua fonts that took place immediately after the war. But even that's not borne out by the evidence. Walbaum's own dear Theodore was cutting equal parts modern Roman fonts and black letter fonts. In still a third version of the story, Walbaum's earliest fonts just got old. Eustace and Theodore continued to work together for another 16 years between the 1812 specimen and Eustace handing over the keys in 1828. That's a lot of time to make better type than you did when you were in your 20s and 30s. Perhaps even enough time to be embarrassed by your first album. In the early 20th century, Brockhaus gathered a portion of the Walbaum's fonts together to produce a book entitled Walbaum Schriften, or Walbaum Types. It included Roman, Italic, and black letter fonts. This booklet, brief as it is handsome, brought renewed attention to Eustace's work perhaps strategically. In 1918, the Walbaum matrices were sold to Berthold. Since then, there have been a healthy handful of Walbaum revivals. The first, by Berthold, and then notably a copy of the Berthold version for the monotype machine in the 1930s. In the digital era, we have Linotype Walbaum, Scan Graphic Walbaum, and the handsome Walbaum 2010 by Frontus Storm and a Walbaum Antiqua produced by RMU, and of course, most recently, recently, our extensive Walbaum released in this year. The research associated with our Walbaum project, as you can tell, has been a genuine pleasure and passion for me. I'm deeply grateful to Monotype for supporting it and believing, like Carl and I do, that it was essential to the quality of the family that we produced. And I'm deeply grateful to all of you for your time and patience and attention here tonight. As I mentioned to my colleagues at Monotype, all of this information is very interesting, downright riveting, to me. I can only pray that it was interesting in some small part to you. Entertained or not, I hope that you'll join me in thanking Eustace Eric Walbaum for his estimable contribution to typography during this, the 250th anniversary of the year of his birth. Thank you.